Nick, welcome to studio. Great to be with you. Nick, Monday the 24th of August had major consequences and a lot of people worried. What does it mean? Well, we don't really know because uh, it was a moment in which the Chinese economy had a big effect on equity markets all around the world. As we all know, China has now become an engine of the global economy. And so it seems to be uh, changing, correcting itself. What we do know about China is that it's become a consumption economy now as it matures, which is very natural, and its focus may shift uh, from being a major exporter and importer. And that's a pretty natural phenomenon because Chinese incomes have risen over time. I think the interesting part is what the implications are geopolitically and globally. Japan in the 80s mm. was in a similar position to China, growing, exporting and opening itself up to the world. Also hit a crash towards the 90s. Are there any similarities? Well, it's very difficult to make exact comparisons, but you're right. Uh, Japan grew from about 19, late 50s through to about 1990 at a rate that was almost unheard of. And it went from being in the 20th largest economy to being the second biggest economy. But it did so without really innovating. So it innovated in Japanese terms, but it largely copied the American industrial system and improved it. That's how the Toyota came about, as it were. So the Toyota effect was lower cost, better quality. And that's what Japan did for 30 years. It competed on cost and extremely good quality. China is a very different kettle of fish because we're talking about 1.3 billion people as opposed to Japan's just over 100 million. And we're talking about an ancient civilization that has modernized suddenly in a, in a burst of speed, a little like America did from 1880 to 1950. Um, so we've seen these, these econ economies that go through very rapid growth, the challenges to sustain it. And I think for, to govern China is very, very complicated. Japan was a bit more isolated and simpler to govern. It lost its way for different reasons. So the comparison has some value, but I'm not sure it's exact. If we look at the consumerist aspect, China is also grappling with the demographic issue where its birth rate is slowing down. What does that mean for it being a consumer-led economy? Demography, population, plays a huge role in the nature of a country and, of course, its, con its economy and consumption. So what we, we had in Japan is a massive drop also in the population growth rate. And this, we know in China, will be an issue in the next 20 years. We're going to have a growing population a bit like Europe with no young, not enough young people to fill up the, the chain, as it were. Over the short to medium term, a lot of other economies are dependent on this giant called China. What does it mean for those dependent economies? Well, you see, I think what's interesting, of course, is you've got to look at the world map now and say our focus strategically should be on the Pacific. It's Southeast Asia, India and China is where a lot of the action is going to be. We've come from several centuries of the Atlantic model of Europe and then the United States, and they all still be factors, but we now live in this much more interesting era of the Pacific Rim. So what the effect's going to be is hard to tell. Um, China may uh, trade less with the world. It will develop its own internal economy more. We've seen that in, in, in social media, in consumer goods, etc. Uh, and this will have a big impact on, on how the, whole eco the world economy fits together. We're living in an era of globalization that's unparalleled. We're all connected to each other. Um, and so the ability of leaders and policymakers to get the policies right, both in terms of conflict, in competition and cooperation, is, is absolutely critical. Policy considerations for African countries who were resource and commodity dependent, what does a shift entail? I mean, we really are living in a time now of some significant shifts. The Africa rising story has been very important. Urbanization, Africa, larger middle class, more democratic government, more accountable government is the order of the day. But the resource pricing is a major problem for African economies who still primarily rely on foreign exchange from exports. And China has had a grand plan uh, in terms of resources and markets in Africa. I think a lot of countries want to balance their relationships. So they want a strategic relationship with China and with India, perhaps, and then the West in terms of Europe and the States. And Africa is in a good position if it, if it has the leadership and governance right. If, it develop, if these countries develop a cooperative strategy inside Africa so that we can work together 
The Chinese summon us to China every few years to tell us what they want. And what we should be caucusing before we go as African economies to tell us what, tell them what we need. This power relationship is too often unequal when we have 54 countries. It's a bit like Europe in the old days. Europe benefited by becoming the EU and getting the benefits of synergy. And in a the African agenda in the next 20 years has got to be much more about that so that Africa can stand its ground in trade, in regulatory, in global multilaterals uh, and work together far more. It's absolutely in our interest to do so. Much of China's growth has come from exports, low cost labor and so on. With rising demographics income in China, is there an opportunity to, for Africa, for example, to take over some of that manufacturing? Yes, I think that's uh, likely to happen in certain areas. South Africa, of course, is a very high-cost manufacturing area in Africa. But East Africa, I think, has quite a bit of potential for this. The education system's better, the costs are much lower, and it hasn't gone through that phase of industrialization yet. So I think East Africa has quite high potential for this, it's a bit of West Africa as well. Monday's turmoil on the markets pointed out how interconnected the world has become, with China devaluing their currency, the U.S. having to make decisions about their interest rates. What does that mean from a geopolitical perspective? This is a fascinating era. This is what globalization means, is that the interdependencies and the interconnectedness then become, requires very skilled diplomacy to make decisions, all sorts, financial decisions, uh, political decisions, economic decisions, taking the other, it's like chess. You, in chess, you make a move thinking through what the other side's move will be and what move you will make depending on how they react. And that is what geopolitics and diplomacy is about. And the policy implications for a small e economy such as ours is to keep your eye on both. Well, no, I think it's deeper than that. I think the first question is the policy implication for South Africa is it's a rule taker. It is a smallish economy, even though it's quite large in Africa, um, and it has to fit into the system. So when you go and play soccer in the World Cup, you don't decide your rules. You play according to the rules of the game. And we're not a rule maker. We're by and large a rule taker. South Africa has a role in the African economy, which gives it more room to play, as it were. Africa is largely our domain in which to engage cooperatively with the other economies of Africa. And there we can be a bit more proactive. But by and large, the rand dollar exchange rate or the level of investments that come are a consequence of these interdependencies amongst the big players. And as I said earlier, the big players are the United States, Europe, India, China and Japan. There's some second order big players, but those are the main forces at work. They are the main powers. And I think what's interesting is China may not be trying to become a global hegemon. It might. Never has a country risen to such rapidity without seeking to assert itself. So China will definitely push into Southeast Asia and assert itself more. But if it really gets into domestic trouble, it may have to then stay a bit more at home and pay attention to that. America was very fortunate to have 100 or more years in tremendous growth and innovation, which it still has, and therefore does play the role of, of a major superpower. And China may rival that, or it may have to stay at home as it deals with its own issues. I think China is at a period of risk now. It's played out its first phase. Japan wasn't able to change gear. Japan missed the knowledge economy that grew out of Silicon Valley. And China's real innovation will now be tested to see, can it lead? If you're the second biggest economy on the way to being the biggest, you have to lead through innovation. And we haven't seen that yet. It may come. It can't all be doom and gloom. What are some of the opportunities for the African continent and South Africa? Well, for South Africa, of course, there is a billion people in this continent with huge natural resources, with boundaries that maybe should be dropped a little and in which there's a huge market for, for South Africa and a huge development era for Africa, which I'm pretty sure is going to occur. And we'll have ups and downs and some will do better than others, some industries, some areas in the regions. But it's a very optimistic time for Africa and it's the speed with which we push and build institutions and have the right leadership and a younger generation that, that comes with different ideas than a previous generation about how countries should be run. Nick Finadel, thank you so much for your time. It's a pleasure.